So the key to nutrients in the aquarium is controlling what goes into the tank and having an effective means of what comes out of the tank. Welcome back to the new, older, shorter version of LA Fish Guys. So the starting point for controlling nutrients in the aquarium is actually with the water that you use. Whether this be a freshwater application or a saltwater application, again it begins with the actual basic ingredient, the H2O portion of the water. That and along with a good quality salt mix. But again the starting point is the water itself. In the past we've used real ocean water. Uh, it was very convenient. I had no real issues with it. The salinity was always consistent. But the reality is it's collected from the ocean here in Los Angeles, more specifically the Long Beach Harbor portion of Los Angeles. So there could be a slight amount of nutrients in there such as nitrates or phosphates. Uh, we've now implemented a more pure means of generating that base water and we're doing it with a five-stage filter system. This has a pre-filter, a carbon filter, has a um, reverse osmosis, and two stages of deionization. What it generates is ultra-pure water. We then take that purified water and pump it over into this container. Once I've got an appropriate amount to make, say, 200 gallons of salt water, I then pump it over into the mixing container where I then introduce my salt into the system. And once that new salt water is thoroughly blended, we can then dispense it into five gallon containers, maybe into my hundred gallon container, and load those into the van and take them out to the customer. At least at that point, what I'm putting in is as pure as I can get. So you've started off with as pure a water as possible. The next things that typically go into the tank is the rock foundation along with the gravel or the sand. In the case of a living reef tank, this might be live rock, might be live sand. The assumption is that it came from a pristine reef somewhere around the world. But it too can be influenced by the industrial aspects or the quality of the water that it was formed in. We've come here to our 150 gallon reef tank that we've been struggling with for many, many years with regards to nutrients. This will make a good example of what to do and what not to do. So I've always said it's either a fish tank or a reef tank. The difference being that the fish tank or fish only system can handle a much higher level of nutrients whereas the living coral reef can't handle as high a level. With today's technology and advancements in filtration you can begin to have a much greater number of fish in a system that has living corals as long as you have implemented some means of controlling those nutrients. This tank is about 12 years old. We made a couple of mistakes in the past. It's had 12 years worth of real ocean water put into it. Not that that's a mistake. Uh, it's had a large number of fish and at one point in time had a large banana eel in there. All of those things include adding a whole bunch of food to the system and we didn't have a very effective means, if any really, of removing nutrients at that time. As I said a moment ago, now there are more effective ways of controlling those nutrients, such as GFO or, or algae scrubbers. Uh, the old thing about doing water changes, which in this case we still do, isn't an effective means of controlling nutrients. So I'm going to go ahead and start servicing this tank. Let's talk a little bit more about those various means of controlling nutrients. As I mentioned, water changes turned out not to be the most effective means at reducing nutrients. While they do provide a dilution benefit, they best serve as a means of flushing out large particles of debris, along with replenishing trace elements. There are some specific zeolite clays that absorb specific nutrients, these being similar to Johnny Cat. Some of these medias also claim to provide low oxygen environments with inside the granules for the natural process of denitrification. Additionally, 
granular ferric oxide, also known as GFO, are able to absorb or attract into themselves certain nutrients. The issue with both the denitrate clays and GFO is its required application in particular slow flow. The fact that they have limited ability and exhaust themselves at some point requires replacement of the filter media. Algae scrubbing is a newcomer to the hobby but only in the sense of its new application. Using algaes previously involved large systems, wave motion, large screens, and strong lights. Today its design is quite compact, easily added to existing systems, and it's very effective. Its biggest benefit, aside from its initial low cost, is it continually provides its own nutrient removing media. Would you like to reduce your nitrate and phosphate as well as algae problems? Consider the Turbos Aquatics LED Algae Scrubber line, which consists of the L2, L3, and L4 models. All units include dual drain system, slotted pipe, growth screen, bulkheads, and dual high quality growth spectrum optimized LED lights and heat sinks. The L-Series algae scrubbers are easily installed and externally mounted either above the aquarium or placed over your existing filter system. Control aquarium nutrients naturally using algaes. For more information, visit turbosaquatics.com. Hi there, my name is Jim Stein and you know me as the LA Fish Guy. Well, I also wear a couple of other hats. One of them is the jellyfish tank called the Jelly Aquarium and the third is MyFishTank.com. I offer an entire line of acrylic aquariums ranging from rectangular to hexagon, flatback hex, as well as the custom curve front aquariums. There's also an entire line of stands and canopies ranging from MDF to pine to oak with a variety of different finishes available. And the website is even smart enough that you can calculate what the freight and crate charges to your location will be. That's myfishtank.com. Reef Hobbyist Magazine believes that our hobby, our fellow hobbyists, and the animals in our care are best served by the free distribution of quality information. Reef Hobbyist Magazine provides hobbyists with critical husbandry information with an emphasis on marine ornamental breeding efforts. Reef Hobbyist Magazine is available for free in local fish stores across the country, or you can subscribe at www.reefhobbyistmagazine.com. Additionally, there's effective protein skimming, there's a process called probiotics, there's also denitrification. The process of denitrification is one where you essentially starve a group of bacterias of oxygen. Those bacterias want to use oxygen to oxidize or convert waste. In a situation where it's a low oxygen environment, such as a deep sand bed or something like that, those bacteria need that oxygen molecule and what they begin to look at is the nitrate complex. Nitrate being one part nitrogen, three parts oxygen. Those bacteria are able to liberate the oxygen molecules and thus complete their process. But in fact, what they're actually doing is turning the process backwards, converting uh, nitrate to, to nitrite and allowing that extra oxygen molecule to bu bubble off. But that denitrification process requires an undisturbed environment. Not always is the sand bed in your tank one that you can avoid disturbing. Another way of handling denitrification would be to accomplish it in an environment outside the tank. Many years ago in the original mini reef filter systems, the actual glass ones with the rotating sprinkler head, there used to be a three or four chamber module that slow flowed water through there. Again, you would deprive the water of oxygen, of which those bacteria wanting to use that oxygen would then break apart that complex. But they required food as well, which was usually something like a, um, a glucose or a sugar solution. That same process these days is referred to as carbon dosing or vodka dosing. 
the vodka or the sugar solution is the food source for the bacteria. And again, they'll only prosper in an area where it's a low oxygen environment. There's another similar process that's also applied these days. It's referred to as probiotics. It's the introduction of a food source and a specific bacteria that you culture directly in the tank. And those bacterias help convert or break down organic compounds and convert them into something that's much less toxic and easier to deal with. There's also the biopellet approach, which is very similar. It uses bacterias, but the bio pellets become the food source themselves for the bacteria that convert nutrients into something much less toxic. Then there's the most common method of nutrient removal, which is a refugium. Quite often it's got a, a thicker sand bed at the bottom providing some type of denitrification, and then it usually has some type of calerpa or algae growing inside there. And of course then there's my favorite, which is the algae scrubber. I'm sure that all of these methods of nutrient removal produce results, some more so than others, and some more costly than others. Aside from the quality of the water, salt mix, the live rock, and sand, your second line of defense in controlling nutrients is the livestock and the food going into the tank to feed that livestock. Some fish will need, as well as eat, more food than others. Some fish will forage off your live rock, and others will require the addition of fish foods. These foods can range from flake foods to frozen to live foods. Being selective with which fish you place into your tank will determine what foods and the amount you'll need to put into the tank. As I mentioned earlier, water changes only slightly dilute nutrient levels, but what they do offer is the opportunity to remove, vacuum, or flush debris from the tank. Removing debris before they're converted by bacteria significantly reduces it from becoming nutrients to begin with. This tank has a sand bed, but it's not intended as an area of denitrification but it is an area that debris settle into. Regular vacuuming, in this case, helps remove potential nutrients. Vacuuming between the various rocks will remove the sediment that has not been swept out by the tank's water flow. Employing filter pads or filter socks that are changed or cleaned on a regular basis also will slow down the development of nutrient buildup in the tank. Over 12 years, this tank has had a number of fish in it. It's also been fed quite heavily. Its live rock and sand have been changed out, but not with new live rock. I tried a number of nutrient removal medias as well as equipment. I'm fortunate as this customer has allowed me to experiment with his tank. Previously, I built a homemade algae filter. It worked, but I figured there might be a more effective version. But that's to be discussed in the next part, so make it a point to come on back for part two of LA Fish Guys as we keep moving forward.